Perfect. All right. Um, thanks, Dino, and thanks, Yanni, for organizing this conference. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our approach to studying mental effort in the lab, uh, in a, it's kind of summarized in a paper which will hopefully be published uh, soon. And when trying to understand what mental effort is in the first instance, first of all, I rely on you guys uh, having uh, given a lot of attention to the last, to the previous talks, because that will kind of set the scene for this one. Um, so when kind of trying to understand what mental effort is, um, first of all, we kind of try to motivate ourselves. Why is it even important? And mental effort is a fundamental phenomenon. I mean, you're all sitting here. It's kind of midway in the session. Some of you guys are tired. Some of you will require more mental effort in order to stay alert and focused and listen to this talk. And that's not because necessarily the cognitive work required changes during the session, but it kind of, it's, it, it depends on all sorts of factors that changes both throughout the session and based on things that happened to you yesterday, how motivated you are, how relevant it is for you. So understanding mental effort is an understanding something very fundamental in human experience. But I'm also a psychiatrist and I'm interested in conditions where uh, patients suffer from inflated mental effort perception. And in fact, it could get so bad that people eventually avoid uh, engaging in cognitive activity, which end up resulting in a cognitive impairment. And this is called uh, a condition that's called apathy, uh, a reduction in goal-directed activity, in this case, in uh, engaging in cognitive tasks, that is highly, highly common, extremely common in neurological conditions, some of them are mentioned here, and in psychiatric condition, which I'm particularly interested in, and some were mentioned by Yael earlier on, and I'll mention them later on, depression and schizophrenia. So I hope I convinced you that it's important to understand what mental effort is, um, but if that's not enough, I'll just, I'll tell you that we clinicians are particularly bad at treating apathy. Um, we have some treatment for depression, but sometimes people have uh, apathy that is over and above depression, and we, we, we are very limited in our understanding and our ability to treat that. So what, what is mental effort? I mean, and I, I always like, when kind of approaching this, I always like going back to the formal uh, definitions. And if I look at the APA Dictionary of Psychology, this is the formal definition that they propose. It's the amount of cognitive work required by a given task. So this suggests that cognitive work or mental work, people use that interchangeably, is basically equivalent to mental effort. Hmm. But we know that mental effort and mental work are dissociable sometimes. I just give you an example that some of you may experience just keeping alert and keeping attending this talk very, very effortful, whereas some may experience it very easy because for some reason they find it interesting. But I'll give you some other examples to convince you that mental work is not equivalent to mental effort. We've seen some of the talks, even in this conference, explaining what kind of intricate computations occur in the brain when just looking at a scene, when just uh, viewing the sunset. A lot of very complicated uh, calculations, which I'm not extremely familiar with because I don't study visual perception, but it's not something that we normally associate with a mentally effortful action. And similarly, when sitting down and watching television, um, it requires a set of cognitive functions like attention, working memory, kind of keeping track of what's going on in the series that we're watching, and also long-term memory, just remembering what happened in the previous episode. But again, we wouldn't necessarily associate that with a mentally effortful action. But lastly, when we need to complete some questionnaire, some, questionnaire, some scales, or here fill out a tax report, it's something that we we may find mentally effortful, even though it doesn't require a whole lot of cognitive work. So, um, so, so it's important to make this distinction between cognitive work and the experience that is associated with it. But when we come to look at the neuroscience literature, the situation is no more better than what I've just shown you. Even in the same papers in neuroscience, people use the term mental effort to refer both to the work that is done and to the subjective experience associated with it. So what we propose is to make a clear distinction between the two. Um, mental effort referring to the subjective experience, and I'll explain why clinically we think that's important to make that uh, distinction in a minute. And mental work is basically what is mediating between the action, 
kind of a mental action and, a, and, a, and an outcome. And this distinction uh, helps us understand or think about certain clinical conditions that show cognitive impairments uh, a bit differently in terms of their underlying mechanisms. So now if we make that distinction, for instance, then we can think about conditions like dementia, or neurodegenerative conditions, or neurodevelopmental conditions associated with cognitive impairments as affecting the kind of cognitive musculature, the ability of the brain, the processing capacity, the ability of the brain to carry out cognitive work. Whereas, in contrast, other conditions like, which I mentioned earlier, I mean, classically depression, which show, where patients show uh, reversible cognitive impairments, people have um, ex experienced mental effort differently, which influences whether they will end up engaging or disengaging from a task. So we think this distinction is, is important to understand the mechanisms. I mean, yes, Tom said uh, mentioning the word mechanism is, is important for publication, so I'll, I'll use that again. Um, but then it brings all sorts of questions to the fore, and I will have limited time to discuss uh, a few of them. First of all, if we then make that distinction between mental work and uh, mental effort, then, then what is mental work then? Well, apparently, when going to the literature, again, it's, it's becoming, it's, it's a slightly difficult question because whilst we understand that in the physical domain, we kind of understand what the physical musculature is, we know how the muscles work roughly, the physiology, but in, in mental, uh, in terms of the mental work, the mental equivalent of the musculature, what is going on in the brain? We don't really know that, that's not very well defined, uh, let alone measured. So, um, some of the suggestions here, um, and this is work done by Sebastian Muslik and Jonathan Cohen, and they propose uh, that the basic currency that the brain uses as, a, as the mental work, as the musculature of the brain, is this uh, enhancement of, of the, the task-relevant signals while suppressing task-irrelevant signals. So, it's called the structure suppression. And this is relevant both within a task and across tasks. And people always use, when studying uh, cognitive control, uh, that people use uh, the Stroop task because it's been used for so many years. Um, and it's, it's, it helps us understand things a bit intuitively. For any one of you who's not familiar with the task, um, the task here is to re either read out, report the ink color of a written word. The task becomes a lot more difficult when the written word, in this case red, does not correspond, does not match to the ink color. So what is mental work in this case, according to uh, Sebastian Muslik and Jonathan Cohen, they, they, they propose that the particular work here is the separation or the enhancement of the uh, blue, task relevant blue signal compared to uh, the red, because we are prone to read the, the, the word red automatically, it has this kind of, um, this distractor representation in the brain. I don't like using the word representation often, but if I had a few more minutes, I'll also say why, but I don't, unfortunately. So, okay, so we, we, we kind of figured out that the mental work is not very well defined or measured. There are some suggestions, but why do you experience it in the first place? And here I'm going to rely again on you having paid attention to the last talks because the neuroeconomic approach has gained a lot of traction in recent years. So this suggests um, some of the work that Florent showed, that the, the brain combines um, information about costs and benefits in order to make a decision whether to make an action or not. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, and again, the previous speakers talk about, talked about the reward and mainly external rewards like money that we use in the, uh, in the experimental labs, but we also use uh, internal rewards sometimes, like psychologically driven uh, reasons. And effort in this case, or mental effort, as, as I focus on in this talk, is, uh, is thought to represent, reflect whether directly or indirectly, some kind of cost. What is this cost? Some have suggested resource depletion. Um, so this has kind of uh, become less uh, fashionable in the last few years. And it, it, it might be that effort or the experience of effort simply reflects the anticipation of resource depletion rather than resource depletion per se. So 
in this case, this is the neuroeconomic approach suggests that if the reward outweighs the, the effort or the, the kind of represented cost, then it tells the brain to do it. So that's the role of cost, it's a, of effort. It's an aversive signal that kind of reflects um, costs, whether directly or indirectly. But importantly, and that's a suggestion from Kurtzman and colleagues about 10 years ago, the concept of opportunity cost is very important. So it is not always the currently engaged task where uh, effort uh, signals whether I should do things or not, but also uh, when experiencing effort within a task, it also reflects other opportunities. So opportunity cost is basically the reward I'm missing out when choosing one kind of set of actions. And this idea suggests that if I, even if I'm engaging in the same action, which requires the same amount of mental work, if the opportunities out there start kind of becoming more salient and more rewarding, then this predicts that I will experience the current action as more effortful, even though the amount of work hasn't changed. So to summarize this, um, it suggests that the utility maximization, the, so there have been suggest, um, the previous speakers mentioned utility, it's this relationship between cost and benefit. Um, so the idea that the brain is trying to maximize utility um, and this kind of represents um, mental effort and mental eff effort is an aversive signal, largely aversive signal that has developed to control behavior through task switches, uh, persistence or inhibition. And lastly, at the implementational level, um, borrowing from MAR three level of representation, the suggestion is that distractor suppression is the cognitive work. Yeah. Um, I won't have too much time to go into the, how the brain signals this because I've already got the one minute notice, but the suggestion is that the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex uh, integrates these signals and then kind of guides behavior accordingly. But I will, the last slide will be on why why we think this has uh, impl implications to neuropsychiatric conditions and how to study those in the lab. And this um, is summarized here in this slide. So this suggestion, everything I've, I've talked about so far, has some implications for uh, the, the approach to studying mental effort in neuropsychiatric conditions. Apart from the fact that it dissociates conditions like, as I said, dementia where, or brain damage in general, where the cognitive apparatus is impaired, it's um, it kind of brings to the fore conditions where mental effort is, is impaired. When these are the ones that I'm, I'm kind of uh, suggesting here, that depression is, a, and this is not work done by us, is a state of flattened um, reward landscape. And if you go back to this figure, then if utility is, al is already uh, down to a minimum, we will experience everything as very mentally effortful and not worth engaging in. Similarly, uh, ADHD, we think that there is an aberrant cost uh, uh, opportunity cost calculation, where there are a lot of salient signals out there that suggest that whatever I'm doing now is not as good as the things uh, available out there. And this leads to excessive task switches. And lastly, in schizophrenia, we think there is a combination of impairment between the uh, cognitive apparatus, the, the disturbance in the cognitive uh, work, whether because of neurodegenerative or neurodevelopmental conditions, uh, depends on what school of thought you are, and uh, inflated uh, mental effort uh, cost. So I'll just thank uh, the people who contributed to this work and members of my lab, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Noah. Um, we have time for one question. Um, anyone? Okay, so I'll ask a question. Yeah. Um, what do you think the role of maybe either motivation or if I'm tired or not, how did that influence the mental effort? Does it influence specific stages like the utility or the other stages or just a, a global signal? Yeah, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, first of all, it just goes to show that mental work and mental effort are not exactly the same. And I would suggest that it kind of moderates the relationship between them mainly. So even though the kind of objectively, if there is such a thing, the same amount of work goes into a task, um, you may experience it very differently depending on your motivation, your fatigue. So it's kind of like moderating effects. This is the short answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.